guys, welcome to the Hustle and Flow podcast. The platform we use to explore varying perspectives and opinion through candid conversation. We chat about philosophy, business, and all things life. I'm Sean the Hustle. And I'm Les the Flow. Let's go. All right, guys, our guest today was born and raised in Huntersville, North Carolina. As a young man, at the age of 19, he joined the U.S. Army, where he grew as an individual and on to become a fine leader. While he accomplished a number of great things in the military, his greatest accomplishments include attending basic leadership school, competing in the 1984 Olympic boxing trials, and giving his life to the Lord. He has been a licensed minister for over 20 years, and in 2001 became a therapeutic foster parent. He and his wife devoted 15 years of their life to this work, receiving numerous certifications in the field. In more recent times, he has turned his attention to writing, having recently authored and launched a bestseller. With that, I would like to welcome today, Tony Douglas. Thank you. Appreciate you guys having me on the show. Thanks for coming on, the attorney. Uh, really uh, a pleasure to have you on. And um, I think Sean's given us a little bit of a, uh, you know, a glimpse of what your, uh, your storied life has been about. But uh, what we'd love to do is invite you to, you know, share with the audience uh, your origin story and what makes you the Tony Douglas of today. So, yeah, the floor is all yours, mate. Okay. Uh, just like uh, Sean said, I was I was kind of born and raised in a, a little country town called Huntersville. And in this particular town, if you have watched the Andy Griffith show, that's where I was born, in a small town like Mayberry RFD. <laughs> and it was just one of those towns where everybody knew everybody. And uh, it was the village that raised the children. And so I couldn't get away with anything growing up. And, and, you know, I had all the farm animals around and uh, was able to really enjoy nature a lot versus being in the country and then coming to the city. So being in the country taught me a lot about uh, working hard as a young boy. And I started to think about who I was and uh, getting more insight into the world in which I was born. And I was always curious about nature, uh, curious about how I was made and who I was. And so moving to the city when I was like, oh, five or six years old, six years old, things changed drastically. I was faced with a lot of challenges that I never experienced being a country boy. Even though during the, the weekends, my parents would take me back to Huntersville, they kept me around the uh, old folks, as you were, as, if, if you allow me to say that, the old people, my grandparents, you know, and so being a city boy, you know, being in Charlotte, North Carolina at age of five, I never lost the country um, experience on the inside of me. So the obstacles I faced were being bullied in the city. And, you know, I was this small guy, you know, small child. My parents were small and I used to get bullied uh, quite a quite a bit. Uh, uh, but I had to make sure that I was not going to back down, even though I got beat up. <laughs> I wanted to make sure that, you know, I had some fight in me. And so as I continued to progress as a young man uh, and going to uh, these public schools, uh, I faced even more challenges. Just to kind of give you uh, some insight, um, I was 18 years old and was getting ready to go into the military, and I was 100 pounds. Now, that just goes to show you how small I was. And uh, uh, so, you know, I was a, <laughs> I was a candidate <laughs> for getting picked on. <laughs> and so that, that wasn't good at all. 100 pounds, and when I went into the military, uh, to sign up, I failed the weight test. Can you believe that? <laughs> failed the Army weight test. So what they did, they sent me home uh, 
to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and bananas to put on three pounds over the weekend. <laughs> and so that's how I got, in, got into the army and passed that test. That was wild, man. I'm telling you, that was something else. And see, when I was growing up in that neighborhood, uh, people used to pick me last because I was so small. I said to myself, you know what, what is it about me that is good? What, what's What's um what's about me that I have on the inside that I can be better? Instead of looking at all the other boys that was bigger than me and hit harder and way much more than I do, I thought to myself, well, I can outrun them. I can, you know, I'm faster than they are. I can squeak through holes that they couldn't, where they couldn't catch me. And so we used to play football in the street all the time touch football. So that's what I did. I would use my speed. And before I knew it, I was uh, tackling the guys and I was, it took three people to block me. And I was the first one on the team that people wanted to pick for a change. So all of that began to change for me as a little boy. And it taught me something. Don't look at the exterior things look at what's on the inside of you and, and bring that out to the world. You know, what qualities do you have, Tony, that you can add to the world that you can, things that you're good at. And so uh, that's what I did. And I found myself in a position where I was popular in the neighborhood. I was popular in school. And then I had another challenge. Now, this is funny, guys. <laughs> this, is make, this makes me laugh when I think about it. I don't know if y'all are familiar with uh, the, the candy lady. You see, the candy lady is the mother of the neighborhood who sells candy to the children in the neighborhood. Everybody goes to the candy lady house. And so the candy lady's name was Miss Janie. I used to go to Miss Janie's house. I say, Miss Janie, everybody's bigger than I am, Miss Janie. What's wrong with me? She said, oh, boy, when you get 13 years old, you know, you, you'll mature. Your body will mature. Okay, 13 came around. I runs down to Miss Janie's house. Miss Janie, Miss Janie, I'm 13 years old. Everybody's still bigger than me, Miss Janie. What's wrong with me? Miss Janie said, mm. Oh, boy, don't worry about it. When you get 16, everything's going to kick in for you. I said, okay, Miss Janie. Ran down to Miss Janie's house. I was 16 years old. I said, Miss Janie, I'm 16 years old. What's wrong with me? She looked at me, and she said, mm, well, I tell you what, Tony. When you come 18, when you become a man, that's when your body's gonna change. 18 years old. This was the time I was getting ready to go into the army. So 18 years old. I run down to Miss Jane and how, Miss Jane, Miss Jane, everybody's still bigger than me, Miss Jane. What's wrong with me? She took a swallow. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't know what was wrong with me. So then <laughs> I was messed up. Miss Jane didn't know what was wrong with me. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I'm like, where do I fit in this world, you know? <laughs> it was <laughs> messed up. But anyway, I got into the Army, and I joined the boxing team and uh, became a fine soldier there. And uh, once I got out of, the, out of the military, I opened up my own boxing gym, and uh, things took off. And I got married to my wife, uh, been married for over 33 years now, that's to one woman. Now, that's an accomplishment nowadays. <laughs> one woman, one wife, 33 years. And so things have been going really good for me. And, um, and then when I started uh, uh, into, into the ministry and giving my life to the Lord and, and, you know, that was one of the best decisions I ever did in my life. And so uh, to kind of move things forward, I, I, I was struggling 
in my relationship with God and knowing who his voice was. And then I wrote a book and uh, that has taken off and it's, and it's been good. It's been really good. So that's a kind of a brief synopsis of uh, my life story, so to speak. Thanks so much for sharing that with us, Tony. Um, sounds like you've had a very colorful life and that you learned a lot as a young boy. And I kind of want to take you back to that time um, because you mentioned, you know, as we heard that you were a small guy, you were getting picked on a lot and that um, instead of focusing on the negative, you really went to the positive and you thought, what is within me? What is it that I have that I can bring out of myself and bring to the world and share with the world? My good qualities and i'm just really curious that as a young boy who was getting picked on how how you came to that instead of because you know like we've all experienced bullying when we were younger the three of us that are here at school and you know it's really easy to start to believe the things that you're told and you know get a bit down sometimes but you chose the opposite and, and i'm just interested as a young boy how did you come to that well because i have been picked on i spent a lot of time with myself. I spent time thinking uh, alone. You know, I was, I was a kind of a, a loner for, for a very, very long time. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about who I was, you know, where did I come from? What did I have to offer? What's going to make me better? than anybody else. Everybody's looking down on me. Everybody is looking at me like something is wrong with me. I had to change that mindset, you know. Yeah, I'm small because my parents are small, you know. So how can I offset that? And so I just started thinking. I just spent time thinking. And then I had to be I had to I had to be courageous, so to speak. I had to take courage in do what I thought that I could do. And, you know, these guys that I grew up with, they was rough, tough. I grew up in some tough neighborhoods. You couldn't, you know, walk away from a fight. You better fight. And if you get beat up, they'll respect you. But if you get, uh, you're scared and you start running and things like that, oh, they're going to have a field day with you. You just going to continue to get picked on. So. I just started taking courage, taking an assessment, and then I would say oh, to myself, okay, I'm going to try this. And then that's what I did. I started, I started using my speed, and those guys just couldn't, couldn't, uh, couldn't block me. And some of the older guys that was like 17, 18 years old, they would really get mad at the other guys on their team saying, Y'all can't even block little old Tony. He don't even weigh that much, and you can't even keep him and block him. It took three guys to block me simply because I used what I had to my advantage. Skinny, small, and speed. That's really cool. You know, you use what you had to your advantage. And it sounds to me like you had a reflective process, right? You, you really sat with it, thought about it, and then also decided to do something about it. And then really started to try, test, work out what worked for you. And it seems like it worked out to be very successful uh, for you yeah. going forward, right? Yes, it, it, yes, it, it was. And, uh, and that's a good way of putting it to the way you just said it. You're right. I just, I started testing things. And uh, the more I test, the more confident I became. And the more assured of myself, it just kind of rolled over into other areas of my life in the way that I spoke, the way that I looked a person in their eye, the way that I shake their hand. Uh, it began to start to form me. I didn't, I no longer looked at what I couldn't do anymore or, I, or looking at how small I was. I was always thinking from that moment on I'm not the average little guy. I'm not like that person over there who's my size. So I start thinking big in my mind, and I had a big heart. You know, um, I wouldn't back off from 
uh, obstacles that was in front of me because of how I was raised and the things that I thought about myself growing up. And it took me into adulthood. You know, and one of the things that my boxing coach taught me as well, and he said to always be first and finish strong. And so as an adult, I applied that as well. You know, always attack your, your issues, your challenges. Be first. Don't wait and allow those issues to, to um, come at you. You attack them first. Don't be laid back and be passive. Attack and then finish them off by being strong. Get rid of them. So, so I, I apply a lot of, a lot of um, principles that I have been taught by other men. And as well as spending time alone. I like quiet time. Even as an adult, I have to have my quiet time. Quiet time for me is um, refreshing. It restores my mental capacity. It causes me to connect to the, the real me on the inside, which is spirit. You know, I'm not just flesh and bone. I have a spirit and a body, you know, and so I just make sure that I take every day and be quiet. And so that's what helps me a lot to deal with anything that is facing me from day to day. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I resonate with that deeply um, because I myself you know, I'm a, I'm a strong practitioner of, um, and a daily practitioner of meditation. And I, and I feel you deeply in terms of this, um, this need for, for quiet and stillness for oneself. And, um, yeah, it, it's, it's a funny thing and it's, a uh, it's a funny contrast to what, uh, the world is, you know, generally like these days, you know, it is all about, you know, motion and speed and going and going and going, but, um, uh, it's, it's refreshing to, you know, hear, I guess, uh, people say again that you know there is a necessity for alone time and um, just like you said to refresh and to uh, to get gain clarity essentially uh, you know uh, of of who you truly are and realign with that um, you know so that's very important um, I want to take you back again mate uh, there's many threads that I want to follow and I do want to ask you and touch on your your boxing career in in a moment but um, you mentioned uh, in your in your early days uh, spending time in nature and and the importance of family and and what uh, you know uh, that culti cultivated within you in terms of work ethic and and your ability to work hard. Tell us a little bit about that and how that sort of uh, what that what role that played in developing the man that you are today. Well, being in nature, one of my favorite insects was the ant. I spent hours and hours watching ants. Ants to me were always self-motivated. They always went out to get what they needed to get and to accomplish it. They are so small, but yet they carry a hundred times their size. And um, they always, um, how can I put it? They are always moving toward a certain goal. Um, they're always um, assessing, so to speak, because they, they won't let anything in front of them without it being attacked. Anything that's not that's getting in the way, so to speak, that get, get, gets in their way, they quickly remove it. But one thing I like about the ant is that they, uh, they know what season it is to bring in the harvest. When it's summertime, the ants are busy. They're busy stocking things up for the winter. You don't see them in the winter. That doesn't mean that they're not busy, but they're on the ground doing their own thing. But in the summer, they're gathering in the harvest. So for me, you know, there are seasons in our lives. And therefore, if there are seasons and open doors in our lives, we need to take advantage of those seasons and open doors. Some people don't recognize the seasons. And that's a shame because they don't spend quiet time in order to do that. 
You mm -hmm. have to spend quiet time with yourself in order to know what doors you need to go through, what opportunities you need to take. You know, what do I supposed to be doing right now in my life? You know, mm -hmm. and so the quiet time and growing up on the farm and and doing my chores on a consistent basis at certain times allowed me to take that those lessons into my adulthood. I never forgot them. And uh, the ant is still my favorite insect. <laughs> Ain't nothing like an ant. <laughs> and it's so true, mate. It's yeah. so true. I mean, uh, listeners of this podcast will hear Sean and I talk about the seasons and, and the transitions that we uh, each go through in life, uh, you know, on a cyclical basis, you know. Um, and it's so true. I mean, there's periods when we need to recede inward and we need to ruminate and we need to ponder, you know, and we need to essentially break down a little bit or hide or, or hibernate, right? And that's our, our winter period. And there's periods when we come out of that, right? When, when, when the autumn comes. I, 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 I definitely, yes, yes, it, exactly. Um, being in those quiet times help you to discern, discern the seasons that are there for you. Um, for me, I'm the type of guy that I don't, I don't get caught up in the busyness of life. Mm. Uh, that I see a lot of my, you know, my friends are, I see them going, 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 going. And, you know, they just don't rest. They just don't sit down. They just don't be quiet. And uh, their movements are like rats in a maze. They're not getting anywhere or on a spindle. They're just running, 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 running. running. And then health issues arise. Yep. All kind of other problems arise. You know, if you be quiet and you sit still and allow, um, just, you know, just hear your own thoughts. People, people don't even like to hear their own thoughts so they, because they don't like the quiet time. Mm. There is so much benefit in being quiet. If we could slow the world down a little bit, we would have a better world to, to be in. We won't be, you know, this quick, instant stuff. That's yeah. what gets us in a lot of trouble. I want it now. I don't want to work for it. I want somebody to give it to me right away. I want it right now. When we can't have it right now, then we get upset. Mm. No, life is not that way. You have to wait until your turn. <laughs> know your turn. Know yeah. when your door opens up and then walk in that door. Take advantage of that opportunity because it's yours. Sean, and Leslie, you guys can walk through a certain door I can never get in because it's specific for you as an individual. I Absolutely. have a door and an opportunity that I have to walk through, but I can't discern that unless I be quiet. Couldn't agree with you more. Couldn't agree with you more, mate. Yep. It's... um. It's, it's interesting, right? Everybody's looking to get more and get things now and have what they want or what they think they want. And they're running around trying to be real busy to get it. But what I'm hearing you say is when you slow down, you work out how to do those things. You, we go through these seasons, right? Where we have put in the work, essentially where we collect the fare to be able to jump on the bus or as you put it, to be able to walk through that door. Right. And as you said, I, I totally agree with you that there's different doors for different people. Right. And some of us can walk through the doors that others can't. And, you know, just like you said for us, Tony, I'm sure there's doors that you can walk through that we can't because you've been through processes and, and done the work in your own life in that quiet time to work out what you're going to do once you walk through that door. Yes. Right. And, and, yes. and the, the, uh, the, I guess the funny contrast for me is, it seems like you actually get more by doing less and yes. Right. And, and that's, um, you know, really yeah. profound for me because yeah. Leslie talks about this all the time, which is it's his, his personal creed, which is more and less. Mm. Yeah. 
It's uh, yeah. yeah, it's something that I actually keep on my uh, on my heart at at all times and directs um, all my my movements and actions. And um, you know, it's, it's on my phone, and uh, it's a constant reminder that you know every action that I take, um, it, it it has that principle and value in mind. That um, you know, we, the 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 more we slow down, the more color and and um and detail we can see in life right um yeah. so, so it's such a funny paradox i suppose in 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 comparison to you know how the collective society sees you know the activities of daily life and modern life so yeah it's 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 really nice to be reminded of that i guess um from from someone else's mouth you know using different analogies so it's it's a beautiful thing um and i feel like more people need to you know really take that on and just think about what that means for themselves you know um what i want to ask you now tony and i think that this is um obviously a combination of uh everything that um i guess you've gone through in life and it's been a big part of uh shaping who you are uh your boxing career you know i'd love to you know touch on that a little bit more and just to see what uh how you fell into that and what uh, you feel the sport of boxing taught you other than what you have uh, briefly mentioned the sport of boxing taught me mental strength mental and emotional strength in life we go through a lot of things um there's a saying that me and my best friend uh, have come up with is that is stay off the ropes of life. Mm. And when, when I was in the, uh, in the army and my coach was teaching me, uh, it, it, it just did something for me mentally. I have to make sure that I'm mentally strong I took those things that he he taught me because boxing, you always have somebody in your face in that ring. They're close. They're bringing pressure, uh, not only just mental pressure, but emotional pressure. And of course, uh, some physical pressure as well. And so uh, being able to, to harness the aggressiveness and to be able to relax and not be on or lose my emotions by someone putting pressure on me, that allowed me to handle all the obstacles that come against me from day to day, even now. Everything pretty much that I do now, I always pull back from that experience that I had when I was a, a boxer, uh, mental, uh, emotional, and physical. And one of the things that my coach taught me, he said, go to the well. Now, the well he was talking about was go deep within your spirit and fight from your spirit and not from your head and not from out of your emotions. Because a lot of us, we react to uh, unexpected or negative unexpected events. We respond to those events um, from an emotional standpoint. That means, oh, you know, we, we get frantic and then we wanna jump in there and fix it without stepping back first and calming our emotions down. See, you shouldn't attempt to fix it first. What you should attempt to do is get your emotions under control. Then you can make better decisions on how you need to handle the event. Most of us, we go out there, we go to an event, we're acting out of our emotions, and we make the problem worse. Mm. So when we handle negative events, we need not to respond to the event first by doing something. We need to make sure that we temp, we, we should basically make sure that we, we calm our emotions down so we can make proper decisions. Um, one of the things that I apply to my life today, and this came out of being in quiet, in a quiet place, 
There is a principle that I apply, and it, and it says this. Whatever you let go of will let go of you. And whatever you hold on to will hold on to you. So the things that we don't let go of, they going to hold on to us. If you let them go, it'll let you go. You know, like past failures, you know, disappointments, things that people have said to us or about us, uh, loss of a job that hurt us eternally. We need to let that go so that we can be free to uh, be successful because all of these things will hold us back, restrict us in our mind and our emotions, and we'll be pointing a finger at somebody else or something else, and it will cause us to not be as successful as we possibly could be. Whatever you let go of will let go of you, and whatever you hold on to will hold on to you. Yeah, totally. Totally. I mean, it's um, it's a saying that uh, that's actually from the, the Buddha, I that's think. That's the it, lesson that I learned there that I apply every day. Yeah. No, no, I agree. I mean, um, it's like the, the saying that the Buddha says, it's uh, attachment it is the uh, source of all suffering, right? Uh, when you uh, are able to let it go, then you free yourself of that suffering. And um, I think it's a beautiful analogy that you've sort of put together with, with regards to how you've seen um, the, the sport or the, the martial art of boxing, right? In terms of that constant pressure. And I think it's a, it's a beautiful analogy for life because we are faced in the modern world with constant mental, emotional, and physical pressure of some sort. And I think what you're talking about here is when you've got control of those sorts of faculties, you're able to respond to the situation that's in front of you rather than react, right? Yes, yes. Correct, correct. Because we are reacting the wrong way. If you, if you can stay in control of, over your mental and emotional you know, from a mental and emotional perspective, then you're going to make the right decisions. Your, your behavior is going to be in alignment with what you want to get done. But yeah. if not, it's going to be, it's, you're going to pay a price or a consequence. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you use the, the boxing analogy again, you know, uh, it's a difference between, you know, it, it, and it is uh, something that, will put you in in a in a survival mode right if you've got someone who's coming forward and trying to take your head off so what would you do in that situation you might either run or you just try to swing for the fences and hope that you you, you land a lucky shot but um if you've uh, got control of your emotional faculties then i guess you could read his movements and see where the punch is coming from and then you can faint and then counter and you know try to best your opponent right so yeah, uh, beautiful way to uh, beautiful way to put it. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and, and you know those uh, those things in life has really uh, has taken me far. It really has, and and I am who I am today as a byproduct of some of the things that I've been sharing with you now. <laughs> and um, yeah, it seems that you've been able to synthesize these lessons. Um, you know, and you're able to share them so eloquently and, and clearly for us, which I think is really helpful. Um, have you always been able to do that? Because, you know, uh, as we read out in your bio, you, you went on to become a leader and, and, uh, and a minister, right? And that obviously involves leading people. So I want you to talk a bit about how, that, how you came to that. And it's a really um, interesting contrast for me, again, from a young boy who was being picked on, who worked out what to do and, and how to become strong and how to be strong. And then, you know, really bolstered your confidence and that leading into your life to becoming a leader in your community. So could you talk to us about that and that journey for you? Yes. Uh, the transition seemingly is, <laughs> Oh, one side of the spectrum. I'm over here, you know, beating somebody up and, and, uh, and, and causing bodily harm in the ring. And then on the other side, here I am, you know, uh, this, this, this man of the gospel in the co Christian community circle, 
and is and you know loving people how could you do both <laughs> well i gave up <laughs> the boxing <laughs> boxing was history before i moved over <laughs> to the other side <laughs> and so uh, uh, uh but boxing stayed with me to this to this perspective I teach boxing. I'm, I'm a boxing coach. I actually opened my own boxing gym uh, back in 2008. It's called University of Boxing. And I just don't teach people how to compete in the sport. I teach more about life skills, you know, about uh, how to think and um, how they're going to handle life when they become an adult. So the, the, the age group I teach is about from age uh, 13 all the way up to age 70 years old. And uh, I even have females that are in my, uh, in my uh, boxing club right now. And some of them are what is national golden glove champion. And she was like 34 years of age. So wow. I left one, but it's still combined. I just use my skills in a different way now. And I combine my ministerial skills in the gym at the same time. You know, I exude patience and love and grace, but yet at the same time, I'm a coach. And I'm going to push you, and I'm going to get the best I can out of them because for me, there are... I'm helping mold an individual for life. And so that's what I do. I, I take whatever is sent to me and it can be in bad shape. And I've seen some people in bad shape that just couldn't even turn a rope over their head, not even one time. And, and that was really weak and skinny like I was. And so I take those people and I spend time with them and I lead them and I mold them into the person that they want to be. I uh, create a sense of confidence in them and then they go out into the real world and they're successful. Um, I, there was one guy that, oh, he was the worst of the worst that I've ever seen in my life. It was two of them. And I tell you, I've never seen anybody like that. I thought I was bad growing up <clears throat> but these these two individuals they was guys they had it worse than i did and they was really picked on bad but once i finished with them and took them through uh my look my training course these guys one of them became a uh, state golden gloves champion and the other one grew up went to college fine two fine looking young men and, and uh, they became successful and they're mm -hmm. doing really good. And they always tell me, it's what you taught me, coach, when I was in your, in your boxing class that helped me as an adult. And so that's how I, you know, I went from <laughs> one hard guy that will hurt you over to the soft guy that's, you know, a minister and, and all of that, you know, that journey though, that journey was rough getting over there. There's a lot in between that uh, I haven't mentioned that got me over to uh, the leadership, the ministerial piece there. And so uh, it's been a journey, but it's been a good journey. And every step of the way has caused me to be where I am today and it's taken and launching me to another level. And so mm. I don't despise the day of small beginnings, you know, things that doesn't look like they're going to work out or things that, oh, I don't want to do that because that might be just be beside me. I want to be big now. No, start small. Prepare yourself for that open door. And so that's what I did. I stayed in a preparation stage until the time was right. And then when that door opened, I walked through that door on both ends, on the boxing side and on the ministerial side. When, it's, when it was time for me to write a book, I had already prepared. It, let me say, let me share this with you, um, Sean and Leslie. I studied that, the book that I wrote, I studied that topic for 
18 months, not just 90 days, because that was the initial time frame that I was going to just study just for personal, you know, uh, growth. But 18 months, I stayed on that one subject. I didn't study anything else. And it has totally, totally changed my life. Totally mm. changed. But I, I, I prepared myself for it. And then once it it was written and we're getting all types of uh, testimonies about how that topic, how the book is changing people's lives. So it's about preparation and being patient and spending the proper time that is needed to prepare. Absolutely. And I think, look, like, uh, like, you, like you put it so well, the journey of life really is a process, right? It is a process of, of becoming. And along each, each step of the way, we learn something, but we have to be open to that lesson. Otherwise, it's going to pass us by, right? And, um, you know, on the topic of the book, mate, I'd, I'd love for you to, you know, dive in a little bit more and tell, tell the audience a little bit about, uh, about the book, what it's all about and uh, how it came to be, you know, um, you know uh, written and, and where it is at now. Okay. Um... Just going back just slightly for a moment, I spent 18 months there in, in, on that particular topic. And the, and the book, the title of the book is Discerning the Voice of God by the Leading of the Holy Spirit. And so I, I had this thing in my mind that, well, in the beginning of my Christian walk, I used to think that, you know, the voice of God came from the clouds in the sky because that's all I had had was <laughs> what was on TV, you know, the, the story about Moses. So I thought his the, the voice of God came from the cloud somewhere. I didn't know that, you know, he speaks from within us. And so I learned as, um, as I continued to walk this Christian walk that a lot of people was in the same position I was. I saw a lot of people get abused financially. Uh, I saw them um, get be frustrated and, and, and hitting and missing and not being as successful as they possibly could. And uh, I'm like, wait a minute, something is wrong here. And I couldn't get the answers for years. As a, as a young Christian, you know, growing, I, I couldn't get the answers. So I went through the school of hard knocks until I learned myself. <laughs> And, uh, and then even once I learned, I still had issues with high risk volatile situations or unexpected events that would come because I would get emotional. And so um, that's how the book evolved. And uh, once uh, I started writing the book, I'm telling you guys, I was stretched, I was really stretched. It's so much involved in writing a book if you're going to do it right, you know. And so um, uh, the journey was great. Uh, I wouldn't take anything for it. I learned a lot uh, about different aspects of writing a book. I learned a lot about myself. Um, the book, where it is right now, it's an uh, international bestseller. And uh, the thing that I want to do more in anything else is affect or impact people's lives, whether it's through the book or me working with somebody one-on-one. -on -one. I just want to make a difference in somebody's life. I don't want them to have to go through some of the things I went through, it, particularly if I can help them where they are. If I can spot that situation and I can give them some advice, that's what I want to do. I don't want people to have to go through the hard knocks and get their head bumped. I mean, you, you know, that's going to happen anyway, eventually. But if I can give somebody some advice, like somebody gave me, like my coaches gave me, my parents gave me, I don't think that if I, if, if I get burned, that let me put it this way. I don't think that all the time uh, getting hurt is the best way to learn. In other words, if I put my hand on a, a, a hot stove, I would first want somebody to tell me 
No, don't do that. Your hand is going to get burned. Don't put your hand on the stove. I don't have to experience that pain in order to learn. And so that's what I mean. I want to help somebody, give somebody some advice so that they don't have to deal with some of the things that I had to deal with. Mm. Yeah, no, for sure. And, um, you know, it seems like you've really taken all of those lessons of your life and, and applied them in different arenas, right? And you've been able to, to harness um, all of the sides of you, it sounds like, Tony, right? Like you're, you're a, a tough boxer, and then you were able to transition into that, into your boxing gym and showing people grace and love. But, you know, we have these different sides to us. And, and as you've been talking about with the seasons as well, there's a time and a place for those. And, and I just want to highlight, it's, it's this really beautiful dance, it sounds to me, right? And, and boxing can be seen as a dance too. But um, it's this really beautiful dance. I see you um, dancing through life of taking what you've learned taking time to sit with yourself, synthesize, and then having these lessons emerge that you then flow on and give to other people. And, and now you're doing that through your book. And I think it's really beautiful. So I just want to acknowledge that. And uh, I really want to thank you for coming today, Tony, and, and for sharing all of this with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Sean and Leslie, for having me on the show. It was a pleasure talking with you guys. Um, I can definitely see that you guys are above your years because I hear the wisdom that is coming out of your mouth. So keep learning, keep growing, and uh, also reach back and pull somebody with you. Absolutely, mate. And this is, uh, this is what this uh, podcast is all about, continual learning and, uh, you know, hopefully affecting more people in the positive way that you, you are also doing. So again, pleasure to have you on mate. And um, what I'd lo love to do is, uh, you know, invite you to share with everyone, you know, where can people find you? Uh, if there's a website, if there's, uh, if they want to buy the book, anything at all, what would you like to share and where can they find you? Yes, they can find me. If they want to purchase the book, you can go to amazon.com and just put in the search engine, the voice of God, discerning the voice of God by Tony Douglas. It'll take you straight there to the uh, the sale page, or you can you can go to my website and order the book. My website address is tdouglas.com. That's tdouglas.com. Uh, if you want to just kind of chat with me, uh, you can reach me by email. That's God's with an S on the end. Voice at tddouglas.com. That's God's voice at tddouglas.com. And you can also um, find me on Facebook. That's Tony Douglas at Discerning the Voice of God. Again, it's been a pleasure, you guys. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Uh, thanks so much for coming. And uh, what we'll do is we'll put all those uh, links and details in the show notes so people can find you easily. And if they want to uh, pick up the book as well, they can just click on the links. So again, thanks for sharing, mate. Uh, Shauna, where can people find you, bro? Yep. Easiest place to find me is just on Instagram, Sean underscore Coop. That's S-H-A-U-N underscore C-O-O-P. And how about you, Les? Where can they find you? Yep. You can find me on my website, findingspace.co. Uh, sign up to my newsletter or you can shoot me a message through, uh, through there. Uh, otherwise, on social media as well, it's either Facebook or Instagram at findingspace.co. Uh, you can also get in touch with Sean and I via our email address, the hustle and flow podcast at gmail.com. If you've got any questions about this particular episode, if you want to get in touch with Tony, or if you want to come on as a guest, anything at all, just shoot us a message through there. So once again, Tony, thank you so much. Um, I was just thinking, I think it's really, it's really obvious to me here why your ma wife has been married to you for the last 33 years. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> your energy and, and you're such an interesting man and, the way you share stories is beautiful, man. So I wish you another 33 and, and well on into that. And um, I'm looking forward to staying in touch with you. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great day. You too. Thanks, guys. Until next time. See you guys. Bye. Bye.